says, can I have one? <laughs> no! I mean, I will be in the... Do you want any fries? No, 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 I'm good. Are you sure? Do you want any fries? No, no, I'm good. You pull up to the window, the fries come, and they start smelling the fries. Can I get one? And you're a Christian because you can't really say what you want to say. Take one. One, one, I said one! <laughs> I don't know what... Am I the only one like that? I will buy you fries. Just don't take mine. <laughs> but so often generosity is just not our heart. You could take one and that's it. But here's the thing about the God that we serve. He took his most valuable possession, his son, and gave him on our behalf. And then he said, everything else is freely yours too. Now, if I was God and I gave up my son, which I would not have done. You guys are lucky I'm not God. After I gave up my son, I'd be like, y'all just happy y'all got him. That's all you're getting. Don't come to me. Don't ask me for anything. You just go on. You got the best that I have. But God says, no, not only did I give you my son, but I gave you everything that you need for life and godliness. He gave us his best, and he continues to lavish us with the resources of heaven. We serve a God that is over and above. But here's the thing. We were made in the image of God. So God expects us to live the same way. We can't be a one fry church. <laughs> you got to write that down. That's good right there. <laughs> we need to be the people that when someone asks for one fry, we say, have the whole thing. That we are, is there anything else that I can do for you? Is there any other way that I can serve you? We should be the people that go over and above for those around us. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. In other words, if you want to know what kind of church, what kind of religion God is looking for, he said, this is it right here. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In other words, God's saying, this is what I expect from you. I expect for you to look out for those that can't look out for themselves and do not take on the mindset of this world. Here's the mindset of this world. Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. The mindset is, what can I get, what can I receive, and everything else is every man for himself. Now, I'm not going to jump into politics. I, I try to avoid that, but I will say this. If you look primarily how this nation is voting, it's voting based on who will get me the most. Who, when I put them in office, I will receive the most that I can get. As opposed to saying, how can I make sure that those around me are able to walk in the fullness that God has blessed me with? It is so important that we adopt the heart of generosity that God has. And he said in his word, he said, be careful that you are not polluted by the mindset of the world. Now, this is what pollution is. Pollution is not taking something out and replacing it. It's taking something that's pure and mixing it with something that's not pure. You know, a lot of milk and just a little bit of arsenic. It's a pretty nice milkshake, right? I don't want no part of that. But this is what happens, and, I, and I'll tell you this. When it comes to generosity, this is one of the areas that has been polluted the most in the kingdom of God. And it's what a lot of people have dubbed prosperity gospel. And here's the mindset of that, that the more you give, the more God will give to you. So the only reason you should give to others is so that you can get from God. Does that make sense? You have something that's pure, a heart of generosity, but it's polluted by the mindset of the world. It's still about me. I'm giving not because this person needs, but just because I want more. And as soon as I get rid of this, I get more. So here, who, it doesn't matter who. Somebody take this so I can receive more. And what we've done is we've taken the heart of God and we've adulterated and to the point where it's normal. But here's the thing, and then what you have 
is you have two extremes. So you have that extreme. Then you have the other extreme that doesn't like that extreme. So they're like, God wants you to be broke, poor, and have nothing. No love for this world. We're kingdom-minded. We need nothing down here. Well, I got to pay my heat bill. So I don't know what you're talking about. But here's the, the Bible says this in Deuteronomy, that God enables a man to build wealth. If God empowered us to build wealth, why would he empower us to build something that's evil? Wealth is not evil. Being rich is not evil. The desire for wealth is not evil. Here's the problem. What are you looking to do with that wealth? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, and this is actually the verse that's on your offering envelope, it says this. You will be made rich in every way. Here's the pure intention of God, so that you can be generous on every occasion. God says, this is why I want you to have more than enough, so that in every situation you can be a blessing to other people. God says, I don't want you to just have enough for yourself, because if you just have enough for yourself, you can't bless those around you. But when you have more than enough, you're able to meet needs every where you go. And then it goes on to say this, so that those around you by your generosity can give thanksgiving to God. This is why we desire to have more than enough so that we can bless God, so that we, so we can bless others, show people the love of God and point them to our provider. Saying this message was brought to you by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I was talking to someone that went to church here, and they were saying they were sitting in church, and, and they, were, they were talking about um, generosity, and that God really just began to move on their heart, that they should walk it out, what they were hearing. And as they walked out of the church, they got in their car, and when they got to the main street, God brought on their mind a friend of theirs that had just moved to the city. They called the person up, and they said, hey, do you mind if I stop by? It was a single mother. And as she stopped by and walked into the apartment, the apartment was completely empty. There was no furniture. There was nothing in here. And instantly, God spoke to her and said, provide for what she needs. She looked at the woman. She said, hey, let's go to Walmart. Anything that you need, grab it, and I'll pay for it. She literally provided everything that that house needed. Why? Because God spurred in her heart, this is what I've called you to do. When I'm talking about generosity, you know we believe in tithing here. That's how we honor God. But I'm not talking about writing a bigger check to the church. I'm talking about wherever you go and you see a need as God leads you, it's our responsibility as the church to provide for that need. That's how people know we're the kingdom of God. You know, we go around preaching, saying Jesus is the only way. You need to serve God. You need to get right. And people are watching. Prove it. Sandy Hurricane right now, the world is watching what the church is going to do. I'm so excited. We're a part of an organization called ARC, and in Long Island, there's a few ARC churches, and one, I believe, is Cross Point Community Church in Hicksville. Come on now, Hicksville. <laughs> Shout out to Hicksville. <laughs> Long Island, but they're literally housing at the church relief workers, and out of the church, Long Island is being blessed. Come on now, our finances is going to that church and helping them bless what is going on in there. That's what it's all about. That's how we're supposed to show the love of God. Amen? So here's the question. This is an honest question. How do I gain generosity? It's not my nature. It's not normally how I am. I, I wasn't raised that way. I'm not a very loose person. I know every penny that I bring in, and it's just not natural for me to let it go. How do I gain generosity? I'm glad that you asked that. The second point is this. Compassion births generosity. Compassion births generosity. In Luke chapter 10, verse 33, this verse that we were reading, it says, when the Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The priest walked by and didn't see him at all. The Levite walked by, looked at him, and kept on moving. But when the Samaritan saw him, something stirred within him, and he had compassion for that man that pushed him into generosity. 
That word compassion in the original language, what it means is a, a deep feeling, a physical feeling in your stomach. It doesn't mean just a, oh man, that's rough. I hope that works out for you. But it means just a sense that you can almost feel what that person is feeling. You can relate to where they are. This is why I believe that Samaritan had compassion for that man. Because he knew what it was like to be standing somewhere and people walking by him like he didn't exist. He knew what it was like to have people look right at him but really looking past him. Because you see, in this time, Samaritans were the lowest of the low. The Jews believed that if you were touched by a Samaritan, that you were contaminated, that you would catch something. They would literally walk, go across the Jordan River and go all the way around Samaria, which was a much longer journey, just so they didn't have to walk through that town. They despised Samaritans. And because he had encountered so many people that looked at him that way as if he was nothing, he was literally dead to them. When he saw this man that was a Jew, he looked at him, and I believe he saw himself. He said, I remember what it was like to be there. I remember what it was like to have people just walk around me and walk past me and just see me but not stop. And because of that, I cannot keep going without doing something about this. 